Unity Water is proud to sponsor this podcast series because we believe great news, great solutions and great outcomes deserve to be shared. See what we're all about at unitywater.com. You're listening to the Australian Water Association's podcast series. I'm Hazel Flynn and with me now is Fatima Shahata, Program Manager at the Centre for Sustainable Water in Cambodia, here to talk about the challenges facing Cambodia's water industry. Hello Fatima. Hey, nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. And we're sitting in a context where safe drinking water and plentiful toilets absolutely taken for granted, but it is such a different story in Cambodia, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. So I think it's like 3.8 million people don't actually have access to improved uh, water and 9 million people don't have access to sanitation. Um, Around about 380 children actually die every year due to diarrheal diseases. And according to the latest statistic I read, it was 32% of Cambodian children actually are stunted, 32% of five-year-olds. So it's quite a massive problem. It is. Very, very confronting, isn't it? Left unaddressed, obviously the situation will only get worse. Population increases from um, about 16 million now Mm. to something like an estimated 19 million by 2030. There are NGOs in the country, they're working, they're trying to improve the situation. Why haven't they produced long-term change? So I think there are definitely, so Cambodia has progressed and that's definitely, so there's nothing to be said about the NGOs in terms of they're not doing enough. The thing is, traditionally we've actually focused a lot on infrastructure, like hardware. We haven't really ever focused on the people, right? So in between 1975 to 1979, a third to a quarter of the Cambodian population was actually killed in a genocide. So that really destroyed their educational infrastructure, their human infrastructure. So like often in Western context, developed context, we actually say that we stand on the shoulders of giants. We really don't. We actually stand on a chain of other people that have incrementally improved for years. So coming to a place like Oswater is amazing because you see so many old people and like they carry with them the weight of their knowledge and they also carry with them everyone else's weight. We just don't have that in Cambodia. Um, So we are now trying to really focus on how do you actually build up that movement, that educational infrastructure from within. And I think that's really the way that we can meet SDG 6. So it was really good to see Francois Gauss this morning talk about in order to reach SDG 6, we need like non-conventional thinking. But also like for us in Cambodia, we just have to build up the educational infrastructure. Absolutely. And a lot of the the cases with those NGOs, people are coming in, they're doing great work, but they're going Mm. away again, aren't they? Mm. So the expertise is there short term and then it leaves. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, like just adding on to that is if you come in as a foreigner, like I came in as a foreigner, in August 2016 with Engineers Without Borders Australia initially and like it took me maybe six to seven months just to kind of begin to understand some of the cultural norms, get to understand oh someone might say this but what they actually mean is this. The communication style is very different so in Cambodia it's kind of like it is the listener's responsibility to interpret what's being said Whereas in Western context, it is the speaker's responsibility to communicate clearly what is being said. So in Cambodia, you have to really watch out for subtext or things like that that as a native, you just don't pick up on. So it really has to be a locally led movement. Yes, well you went there, I presume you went there thinking that you might be going short term and you've stayed. Yes. What, what kept you there? <laughs> um, I think Cambodia is a really beautiful country. Like I. Um, So I was initially meant to leave after a year, so August 2017, and then I said, okay, well, I'll extend a little bit with Engineers Without Borders Australia. And then as I was leaving the second time, December last year, I just had this overwhelming sadness. I was like, I don't think I'm ready to leave. I did this like Phnom Penh appreciation month where I just sat down somewhere and I said, I love this place. Oh, I love that place. I just find the people like captivating. The place has this unique vibe about it. I, I just don't know if I can put it into words, to be honest. Yeah. But you're there for the long haul now. I think so, yeah, potentially. Well, there are some, um, some startling statistics and obviously you're doing something about hmm. trying to uh, sort out the problem, but it's estimated that Cambodia's water sanitation and hygiene sector will need 12,000 employees by mm. 2030. We talked about that 19 million population figure by then. Mm. 12,000 then, it only has 
around 800 now. Mm. Wow, how do you fix that problem? Um, I think it is a huge problem and we're definitely not saying that it isn't. Like there were more people, potentially double the amount of people in the Cambodian water sector that were here today, which is astounding to me. Um, so I think what we're really trying to do is focus on attracting young people into the water sector training them so that there isn't that kind of skills mismatch. So right now we have a skills mismatch. When graduates leave university, and they're often universities that don't deliver WASH specific knowledge, there might be like a kind of engineering course that touches a little bit on some water aspects, public health that touches a little bit on it, but there is no holistic WASH program. So first we want to attract people into the WASH sector, um, and in our session today we talked about how wash is not sexy, human rights are not sexy, but really they're human rights. I don't think they need to be sexy, right? Like it's just a requirement. Um, so first it's attracting people into the sector when it's not the most prestigious or the sexiest thing, then training them so that they can do their job and then also retaining them. So it's interesting, retention is interesting as well because for individual groups like potentially women, there are different strategies that you need to use. So it's been said that to retain women in any sector, including STEM or WASH, the need is really that you have women in that sector because they kind of revolve around each other almost. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's you know a well-known saying, you can't beat if you can't see it. And mm. you can come and you can try a little while, but if you can't see a pathway forward, it must be pretty hard to stick with it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So tell me about the centre's pilot program, because what you're really trying to do is increase those skills locally. Mm. What kind of, how does it work and what kind of results have you had? So the centre is really in its nascent. So it was established kind of end of 2016 um, and we kind of have four objectives. So to build up that capacity, we want to do four things. The first one is the capacity building program, which is the one that's mentioned in the pilot. Then we've got knowledge management, which is kind of like information sharing and creating like local, regional and international networks. Then you've got the innovation program and then you've got the research program. But the pilot mainly focused on capacity building and those programs in included the young professionals in WASH, which we've now done two cohorts. Um, so that is basically an eight week long project. Um, program, sorry, which aims to create like what um, Dr. Brian McIntosh calls the T-shaped um, professional, which is basically the vertical side of the T is you have like this kind of um, depth in one technical aspect, right? But the we are more interested in the horizontal part of the T because the horizontal part is all about your values, your kind of how much those um, contextual, like the background that we talked about at the beginning about the Cambodian wat water sector and the challenges, how much that context resonates with you, how much you can see the goal in sight and how that changes how you interact with your technical learning. I remember as a, like an engineering graduate, I never really, I felt inspired about certain things and definitely some things I was like, wow, physics is amazing but it never then translated into this is what I see myself doing in real life. So we're really trying to, through this program, give them a better kind of technical understanding, but also really develop them into like good human beings who are well-rounded, really care for the community, believe in like community-led innovations and just want to get out there and improve. So, I mean, Cam Cambodia's obviously captured your heart. Yeah. <laughs> How hopeful are you that things can change? You're there, you're working for it, and you mm. must be surrounded by people who are doing the same thing. Mm. How, how hopeful are you that it can change and how long is that going to take realistically? Mm. Um, that's a really good question. In, in terms of how long, I think we definitely need to see some like mass uptake of these kinds of programs in the sector in order to get there because right now we're training maybe 60 people a year that just won't, as you say in Australia, cut the mustard, right? Um, if you want to get there by 2030 and have 12,000 people. Um, but in terms of the change, like I think one massive area of change that all of the programs that we do really is able to do is that um, Cambodians, to kind of generalize, and I really hate to generalize, but Cambodian students are often, as children, as students, they're socialized to be very agreeable, they listen to their elders, they respect authority, by the end of these programs, you kind of start to see people who are speaking up a bit more, they become a lot braver. I think 
honestly developed countries became developed because we really kind of have an unhealthy uh, sorry a healthy kind of distrust of authority so we are happy to point out when there are flaws right continuous improvement relies on the people who go i don't think that's i don't think that's how you should do that you know maybe don't do that that way and if you're socialized to be respectful and you will never speak up and say something then that's a barrier towards improvement. So I think there is definitely potential for these programs to change. Um, we really kind of encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning where they just don't have that hierarchy, they don't have to worry about that. It's just like, get in there, no one will lecture you. You are, this is up to you to learn. So it's kind of problem-based or project-based peer-to-peer learning with, with a lecture, but we're really trying to kind of create these people who are like will know technical skills but will also agitate for change if we can scale up which is really what we're trying to do then i think we could definitely create an amazing sector by 2030 we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna aim for that <laughs> well if your energy is anything to go by you'll get there yeah and is there anything that you think that people from the australian water industry could or should be doing to assist the mission I really think so. So I think I've been able to see what going in there with this kind of I'm listening approach does. So I've done a lot of kind of face-to-face um, -face kind of two-way mentoring. So I've learned so much from the counterparts that I work from. Um, and I've also managed to teach them some stuff. So I think imparting our knowledge to those people, but also learning from them those amazing skills like how do you deal with the community how do you solve a wicked problem when you don't have many resources like there's so many innovations that you look at just because of necessity they've had to be so creative to get around some things that we would just have said get the government to fix that you know um so i would love to see the australian water sector be involved in programs like this like for example for our young water professionals i can imagine face-to-face -face mentoring or exchange programs where people from young people from the Australian sector come and interact with Cambodians or Cambodians come over um, and we're trying to do like internship programs and scholarships and there's so much I think there's so much um, areas for collaboration there I'd love to see it explored more especially there's a session later on about how Australia can contribute to SDGs globally so I'm gonna go there and <laughs> just put my hand up and yeah. Well you keep on firing them up and fighting the good fight. Yeah definitely thanks. <laughs> Thank you Fatima, thanks for coming. And that was Fatima Shahata, Program Manager for Centre for Sustainable Water in Cambodia. Thanks for joining us.